Thanks for joining me for another draw along session. Today we're going to go down to the pond. It's springtime and the ice is melted and the pond is warming and it is teeming with life. We're going to be looking at a lot of the many different animals that live in the pond and the surrounding area and I'm sure you'll have fun drawing these along with me. Thanks for joining me. Right, uh, let's get started here with this drawing. Uh, we're going to begin up here in the upper left hand corner with one little dot. Again, it's the easiest way to start a drawing with a decision to do something. Start right here and I'm going to make a small box in the corner. Those of you who have drawn with me before know that uh, this often becomes a portrait at the end as we get to a point where we can celebrate our accomplishments and uh, draw ourselves here. Um, but right now I'm just drawing a bunch of weekly lines with broken spaces uh, so that we can tear away at it a little bit, make it look like an old photograph or an old poster, maybe about some famous naturalist who went out exploring pond life and became very famous doing drawings of uh, some of the things, the discoveries they made. Um, right now it's just a blank space. But what it does is it gives us a chance to uh, wiggle our way around a little bit to ease into our drawing with extremely simple shapes. Uh, just basically curves like this. We're going to make a big space over here that's going to go around. I'm going to come right down along the edge of my paper here and make it a little easier to see. And I'm going to come along like that. And I'm going to come in a little bit so that when I come down here that little box stands out a little bit away from it. So once you've done that just come back to these spaces and and tear away at them as well so they look old too. They, I want this to look like a treasure map so it looks like we're going on an adventure, a treasure hunt. We're going to look for living treasures today. We're going to look for signs of life, if even from the tiniest eggs and wonder what they might turn into and then watch them grow from their earliest stages in their life right up, on up to a full-grown adult uh, and insects and animals. Uh, we're going to start out right down here in this lower portion and I'm going to draw a shape that is going to fill up some of this space. I want to have a little room up above it, so I'm going to put it right about here. I'm going to draw a line that comes up and over like this. We're drawing a fish, and I'm going to make it look like this fish is coming towards us. So I'm going to make this, this hump a little bit bigger than it really is. Um, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. And then I'm going to come back this way, and it's going to get suddenly very skinny. So it looks like an odd-shaped fish. Um, actually, it looks like a lot of the insects you might find in the water about this time, too. Some of them have rounded bodies like this, and they're in their larval, larval states, and some of them are much bigger. Um, I'm going to draw a line that comes up and over here, so we see the open mouth of this fish as it's coming towards us. And I'm going to draw a line that comes over here like that, and then carry this around so it looks like we're looking up into the mouth of this big fish turning in our direction. This fish is the introduction of living things to this story. And we're going to have an eye that is right about here on its head. And I'm going to make a, an oval. Instead of the round eye of the fish that we see if it was going straight beside us, we, have a, we turn it into an oval shape so it makes it look like it's coming towards us, coming right over to check us out. We're in its underwater world now and it's kind of curious about us like we are about it. So I put a little, a little dot in the center and even that's, that dot is kind of stretched out and tall. Right behind this I'd like you to draw a wiggly line for the gill cover protects the gills of the fish. And right behind that, a little bump right about here for the uh, petrel fin, which is what the fish uses to twist and turn quickly in the water as it swims. I drew a little line coming up above and one down below and a wiggly line down along the end. And if you draw a few little marks like these, it makes it look like the spines that stiffen up that fin and make it strong enough to help the fish go where it wants to. To make this look more fish-like, I'm going to draw some backwards letter C's now inside the fish's mouth. And notice how that makes it look like it's dark in there. I'm going to leave a little more light along the edge here and a little darkness on top. So it, it kind of makes it look more like you're looking into the fish's mouth. The fish has a spine that sticks up right behind its head. This is the dorsal spine, and it sticks up like this. And then it has a bunch of little scoops, letter U shapes, coming back here and down. 
And then you might just do another one here. Now different fish have different arrangements of their fins, different shapes and sizes, but they all serve the same basic purposes. The ones on the side and on the back are for, for the power, for the motion, for the speed and direction. And uh, the one that's, ones up above here are the fins that are kind of like feathers on an arrow. They guide our fish to where it wants to go. And if I draw these little spines coming back here, getting closer and closer, it makes it look like they're going further away. This one here is the one you want to watch out for if you're going fishing. That dorsal spine sticking up is the one that sometimes will get you if you're not careful. And you've got the adipose or the dorsal fin back here. Um, if you draw a, a uh, little tail fin back in the distance, it's actually much bigger than this, but we're making it look smaller because it, we want it to look like it's further away, so it makes it look like the fish is really coming towards us. The next, next effects we add are going to really help make it look like it's coming towards us. We're going to give it a pattern. Now, different fish, different species have different arrangements of patterns to help them blend into their environment. I'm just using some little squiggly lines like these and they're getting smaller and closer together as they go further back. And it makes the back look darker than the belly. If a predator is swimming along underneath this fish and looking up, the light color of the belly will blend into the light coming down from the top through the surface of the water, and it might give this fish an edge, a, a chance to survive and get away from the hungry predator. Um, and again, with the uh, darker pattern on the back of the fish, a fish passing over looking down would probably not even see it. It would blend right in with the underwater environment. I'm going to draw some little curvy lines like these to make it look like there's a darker color on top of the fish. I'm leaving a little shimmer of light along the right hand side over here and I'm leaving a little extra light around the eye here just to give it a little more of a pattern. The fish has scales covering its whole body but uh, up, at, up on top you don't see them so much because of the pattern. Down here you can draw a few little marks and just think of the scale texture of this fish to protect it from it's like a coat of armor to protect it from, uh, in this case, mostly smaller uh, smaller organisms that can get into it and infect it. So but then put a little pattern on this, on the, uh, on the gill cover. And then underneath here, I'd like you to draw some lines that kind of fan out under the mouth. This skin is very flexible. It allows this fish's mouth to open much larger than it looks like it could which gives it the element of surprise if it's sneaking up on somebody who thinks they're too big to be eaten. Um, right down here, if you draw a little curvy line and another one, this is the anal fin. It comes up here and it has little spines on it too. So now we have a fish that's kind of leading us into our story. Right behind this, we have a jungle. This is an underwater jungle of seaweed. And I'm going to start with these lines just wiggling up, and again, I'm putting breaks in them. I'm not sure which is going to be which right now, but we have a number of different kinds of seaweed that we can draw. Uh, one of them is a very common seaweed in the lakes, ponds, and streams of Michigan. It just has little whorls of leaves that come out like this. Just scribble on one side, and then scribble up, and then over to the other side. Just draw the kind of fanning out like little flowers from the side. Coming up like that. That is milfoil, and that grows in great quantities. And sometimes it's kind of a nuisance weed in lakes and ponds because it gets caught in the props of boats and, and stuff. But it's a great seaweed for little tiny fish swimming around. It's like a great playground for them. In fact, here's one now. There's a little fish right there. Remember how you learned how to draw fish by drawing a little bump like that and crossing over to make a tail with the other one from underneath? Go ahead and draw a school of fish back in here. You can have them playing tag. They're going up and down. They're swimming around this and coming back this way and turning over here. You can have a playground here for your little fish. This is a great place for them to be. You know, if they hold perfectly still, they'd probably blend right into that seaweed there. And maybe big fish, hungry fish like this one might not even see them. Uh, to make it even easier for them to hide, we're going to draw some lines like these. Now this is something I call scribble weed. It's just a different kind of seaweed and it's made up of scribbly shapes like this. And it just um, kind of looks different than the other one. 
So we've got this seaweed back here, and I think what I want to do is bring a line that comes out here. And this is going to come out over into this area, and this is going to be the bottom of the pond. I'm going to bring it down like this. To set the stage for the rest of our drawing, I'm going to start right here and pretend for a moment that this is a kite, and we've got this tail of the kite flying down like this. What this is going to do is separate the, the uh, raised... Uh, surface of the water here and the background from the underwater scene down below. So we can kind of focus on the underwater part here a bit and then move our way on up. Um, I'm going to start right down here with an old log that fell down into the water. Maybe the tree was growing and the water water kind of rose in that area and eventually it just rotted out the roots of the uh, the trees and because it was underwater and and now it's uh, now it's just um, lying down on its side and I'll tell you what if you come up here like this we can draw a little line a little curved line like that and just carry this up in this direction like this so you see it coming out of the water here so this is underwater this is above water and if you draw a little curved line like this coming around and another one kind of mimicking this pattern right here See how it makes it look like there's a ripple in the water as though the wind is blowing across the surface and it's making the stick move and then stirring the water in the process? You can use these little openings here to add branches coming off, like this. And here's another one coming up here. This one is going to be a, a place where we can add a little cotton candy. I'm going to draw a little clump like this. You carry it right up and around like that as though it's stuck to this little branch. And there might be another piece of that branch coming out behind it like this to uh, just kind of hold it in place. Right about now, we've got a whole bunch of these little dots here. Little dots that are actually the heads of tiny little, uh, tiny little frog eggs, tiny little tadpoles. They're not tadpoles yet, they're just eggs, and they're still held together in this gelatinous mass of uh, jelly that, uh, uh, that protects it, makes it look larger than the individual organisms here. that would be much more readily gobbled up. Um, so in time, this is going to start, uh, start changing. The frogs are going to hatch from the eggs, and you'll see these little tiny shapes that look kind of like commas or apostrophes swimming about. And you have one swimming this way, one that way. Right now, they're nothing but the larger head and the little tail behind. And it's going to grow like this for some time. It's a, it takes quite a while before the tail drops off after the legs have formed. But eventually, this is going to turn into a frog of one kind or another. We have many different species of frogs in the Great Lakes area. Around here, where I live in, in Leelanau County, in northern Michigan, like much of Michigan, uh, you find uh, leopard frogs are very uh, very common, and you find bullfrogs and green tree frogs and peepers and and uh, wood frogs and other uh, other species. But this is how they get their start. They start out looking like little tadpoles like that, and then before long they start growing up into much bigger looking creatures. And we can draw one of them right here. Um, I want to start with a picture that looks like this. I'm going to have a I'm going to have a shape. Now, what I like to do with it with a frog, something like this, is uh, since I'm drawing with a Sharpie pen, I, I don't have a pencil. I can't lay it out. So what I do is I look at the object I'm drawing, and I draw what's in front first. So I'm just going to draw this little almond shape here. And this is going to be the leg of the frog that's closest to us. And it's going to come out like this. And then from right about here, I'm looking at a drawing that I'm working from. I can come up here with the, the back of the frog and come up to the eyes here. And the other eye is right here like this. I'll draw a little bit of the belly here coming up. And then right in here is where you see the foreleg of the frog coming down. And it's going to be bending back this way. It has little fingers there like that. And the frog's head comes up here like this and wraps around. You see a little bit of the other leg. See how this one kind of kicks out towards us a bit? Well, this one on the other side is going to flare out in the other direction like that. You see a few bumps along the backbone of the frog, and you have that eye in the center here like this, center of the, of the eyeball. 
and the mouth is right along in here, and you can't see it very easily on mine. Uh, they have different patterns, and sometimes they have, um, depending on the species, you might have a pattern of stripes on the legs. You might have a pattern of blotches along here. All of these patterns are meant to help this frog blend into its environment so it's not so readily seen by hungry predators. To make this look a little more realistic, we're going to add a texture to this to this log now. I'm going to make it look like it's old and split. I just draw some tears, some breaks down in here like this. It might have some lichens on it or fungus, so I'm going to draw this a couple little shale shelf fungus here like this, and I'm going to draw some little blotchy shapes like these. And um, all of these shapes and textures are what the frog is basically blending into. It just uh, You find as we put more of this around it, it kind of blends in a little bit better, makes it harder to see. And that's very important to an animal that is trying to grow up big and strong and have young of its own and kind of perpetuate its species and so we've got this little frog in here. And you draw some small holes here. There are a lot of things that like to eat old rotten wood, and the insects will burrow down inside of these logs. And um, along the shoreline, you'll probably find the logs like this lying on the ground. And you might, if you turn it over, find salamanders underneath or, or other creatures that, that like that moist, humid environment. Down here, we're going to draw a... Uh, I'm going to come back into this. I think what I'll do is draw a, uh, just take this tree and, and draw it to make it look more like it's underwater. And I'm, to, to do that, I'm going to make it look as though it's coming up and away from us. So I'm going to draw some lines that curve up and over like this. And what this will do is put a shadow under the edge of the water there. And it'll bring it down in here like that. And I'll put some more marks on this little branch coming out, putting them underneath. So it looks like the water, the, the light's coming down, it's hitting the top of this, this, uh, this log. And I'm going to put some lines curving up this way. See how these, these, this is called contour shading. And I'm just using the curve of these lines to suggest the roundness of this log as it's coming up. And then I can take some of these lines here and just add them to it just to make it look more inter interesting. And down in here, if I take a big chunk out of it here, this would be a great place for some small animal to be. Maybe it's a crayfish hiding out in here. And you could draw that as little claws coming out. It's got a little two, two prong claws and might be hanging out in there. And around it, I, I'm just gonna draw some shapes like these. Some of these might be rocks, some might be clams. You've got clam shells at the bottom of the ponds in the lakes, and um, and you'll also find snails, kind of like these. You can draw them curving up and around, you know, like that. And you see sometimes the snails will be out, and sometimes they're kind of pulled in and hidden. But just draw little shapes down here. You're also going to find a whole lot of just junk laying down here, just pieces of... Uh, pieces of wood, fallen cattails that lived their season out last year and now they've kind of faded away. New cattails will be growing up. So I'm just putting a bunch of this down on the bottom of this picture just to make it look like it's busy and dark. And it also makes this bunch of um, uh, these uh, frog eggs stand out a little bit better too. There's a reflection of this tree this stump that comes down into the water here. And we're going to draw these lines too. I keep it a little a little less sparse in a little sparse here, but you'll see the reflection coming down in the water and and you can add lines like that. In this area down below here, I'm going to draw a uh, an animal that I think what I'll do is I'll draw a rock in this part right here. And on this rock, I'm going to draw one of the main characters of our story is going to be right here like this. He's going to be about that big. He's actually a very small organism at this point. He's got three parts to his body. He's got little eyes up here and he's got legs. He's got six legs like insects do and and he's kind of bunched all in. He's got um, Got little shapes that looks like they might eventually turn into wings on the side, but it's just a tiny little thing. It's got powerful jaws for a little animal, little insect like this as it is. Uh, and uh, what we have here is a dragonfly nymph. 
It started out as an egg, and in time it grew into this odd-looking shape that looks nothing like a dragonfly, no wings at all. But it is already a voracious hunter. This little insect can catch minnows and grab them and eat them. It can catch pretty much anything that swims by that it has an appetite for. And uh, so it's already practicing becoming one of the top predators in this environment that it will be throughout its life as a dragonfly. And we're going to take a closer look at this guy in a few minutes. In fact, um, maybe we'll get started on that right here. I'm going to draw a line that, I'm going to put this over about here on this drawing. I'm going to put a, a line that comes around like that. Kind of looks like it'd be the sun if it wasn't so small, but that's going to be the dragonfly's head. And the next part of the dragonfly is this one right here. This is the thorax. It's kind of like a cherry tomato, a little baby potato, and then we have a carrot coming back here like this. And I'm just going to draw these lines, kind of I'm drawing little skippy-shaped lines here because the, the abdomen of the dragonfly is broken into parts. These individual segments here are what uh, gives the tail its flexibility. On a female dragonfly, at the after end here, you have these two little hooky shapes like on an earwig, and these are the uh, ovipositors, what help the dragonfly lay the eggs, and uh, it'll fly over the water, skim the surface of the water, and lay out a trail of eggs there, and they'll they'll settle down and and um, or attach to grasses or seaweed to uh, uh, to begin their their growth cycle. Um, I'm going to come up here and just darken in the tops of these a little bit. Many different colors of dragonflies. You have the red dragonflies, blue, green, and the black ones. There are so many just beautiful, beautiful patterns. And these are undoubtedly my favorite insect of all, just just for its uh, just for its superior skills and its um, agility and just outright beauty. Of course, butterflies are right up there with it too. This dragonfly has compound eyes uh, made up of many lenses. And if you draw little lines like these going one way and lines like this going by, you get a, a hint of it. They're so small, you really don't even see the pattern unless you're really close looking with a lens. But just to get that feeling crisscross lines to make it look like that eye is uh, sticking out and it's got a really neat pattern on it. And then darken in the back of the head here. Leave a little light on the top and around the side. It has powerful mandibles up here at the front to uh, in its head so it can grab its dinner guests. And it can actually eat them on the fly as they, as they move from one place to another. Just rolling the insect about in, the, in its mouth until the wings fall off and the legs and, and yum. Uh, if you draw a, a line that comes out here, you have the beginning of the forewing, the front wing, and then you have another one that's going to come up this way. Now you notice we're running right off the edge here. That's a, a trick I use just to not have to draw the whole the whole wing itself. But I'm going to draw this wing coming down here like this, and it's going to come out. And different different dragonflies have different shapes to their wings. But, uh, it's kind of fun to look at them and see see which ones here. Which one? It helps, it helps identify them. That's what you're looking for. Color is a main one. Color, size, and that sort of thing. But it's nice to have a guidebook uh, to when you're out hiking, going down on nature explorations, and uh, things that you're most interested in. You could have a whole library of books if you wanted to take them with you. But sometimes, if you're an insect specialist, you want to find a good book on the insects of the Great Lakes, and now I'm bringing the the wings over. You can see right through the wings, which is kind of handy on a dragonfly because you can draw this coming right up here. And then I'm going to darken in the the thorax here, this middle section. It has three parts, and the wings attach to the middle part of this thorax. And the wings have a very beautiful, delicate lace-like pattern that that reinforces or strengthens the wings as a the insects fly, so we're just going to kind of make this up. Just draw some patterns, like kind of like what you see on leaves, but they're a little more varied than that. They come out and they they actually strengthen these wings so that they can fly at great speed and and, um, and with great uh, agility as well. So just draw some shapes, and 
And then the idea is to kind of make it look like those same shapes or something like it on the other side. It doesn't have to be that particular, but I'm just going to, on this wing here, just draw them kind of a leaf-like pattern coming out. So if we have something behind this dragonfly, we'll actually be able to see right through these wings to show it. In this area over here, I'm going to draw a shape of a, uh, I'm going to draw a shape of a bird. It's going to have a an almond shape right here. It comes up and around. Now this bird is much bigger than the dragonfly, but we're going to draw it about this high up, so it looks like it's uh, further away, and it has a neck that comes up like this and over, like a letter S, kind of a shape. I'm going to come down here, and right down here, I'm going to see. I left this space open. I'm just going to add some what we call breeding plumage here, coming down, and just a little of uh, a tuft of feathers that comes down in front of the wing, and or the body. And here's the the wing, and it has feathers on top that kind of overlay, and they can come down here like this, and the tail comes down about there. The head has just a little bit of a Again, an almond shape coming up like that. And it has a long beak, a long pointy beak. This, this bird makes its living catching fish, actually spearing fish or catching them as it wades patiently through the water, looking down through the surface of the water and for any hint of a fish below. This animal has legs that come down like this and and into the water like that, and then another one here. Kind of wide at the thigh up here for support, and they get skinny as they come down in the water, and they probably look a whole lot like, to a fish, they would look a whole lot like the cattails that are growing up from the along the banks of the pond, and so they wouldn't pay much attention to them, but the bird would certainly be paying attention to the, uh, to the fish. Uh, I'm going to draw some little curves around here, just like we did on that stump over here on the log, just to make it look like this fish is standing in shallow water a little further back from where we are now. Along in this area, I'm going to draw a rugged line. It looks like the shore, the muddy shore coming down towards the water's edge. This part here is going to be all sun reflecting on the surface of the water. This will be below the water. And now we're coming over to this area. We're going to have a lot of marsh grasses like these growing up. And I'm going to carry some of them right down over this line and take them into the water here like that. And I'm going to take them behind this dragonfly's wing to make the wing look shinier and more reflective. I take them right up to the log there, and then on the other side of the log I can continue them like this so that they come right to the edge. Now notice by making this dark it makes the pond look shinier, more reflective. And you can also imagine the reflections of these grasses coming down towards us on the surface of the water. So just draw a few lines that wiggle in our direction here. That adds a little bit more believability to the, uh, to the scene. Back in this area, I'm going to draw land coming down here. And then further back, I'm going to take it up behind the bird like this. So we see the lay of the land here. We see this first slope coming down towards us, and then this next slope taking us further back up. And on this back area here, I'm going to draw some trees. These will be the farthest ones away from us here. I'm going to put them right along this ridge in the distance. So we see the surrounding environment of the pond. Very often, uh, you'll, you'll see nowadays around ponds, you'll see farm, plowed farmlands and, and uh, sometimes meadows and fields. And So we'll draw this back in here. We'll have an a open area here. And then in the background here, I'm just drawing these tree trunks coming up, and I'm going to draw some conifers here, these cone-bearing trees with their needles, and I'm just going to draw some choppy little lines going one way and the other. 
they're far enough away we don't have to worry about details. We just want to make them look like, like pine trees of some kind. These could be spruce and uh, cedar. Cedar loves to grow close to the swamps and marshes. So just a few lines one way, a few lines the other way, and don't have to worry about it being perfect. These trees are far from it. They, uh, they might all want to ideally grow in a particular way, but life throws them curves. Sometimes they get struck by lightning. Sometimes they just don't get enough water or sometimes too much water, and they adapt. They uh, do what they have to to survive. And, and if you want to make it look more dense like a forest, you can add a few more back here as well. Now, see, what we've done now is we've got a real strong foreground area here. This one tree trunk here is as big as those in the distance. But uh, by drawing them small, it gives us the illusion of depth. We're going way back in our drawing here. So we'll be able to show more information in the background. I have some other things I want to put in the water as well. Um, I talked about this little dragonfly nymph here and uh, the things that it would eat, minnows and things like these little tadpoles, they'd love to catch those guys and this. And now it's flying up in here and it can pretty much eat whatever it catches. Um, we have other insects flying through here as well. And some of them start out right along this same time period. I'm gonna draw one right here. This is going to be a, it's got a little head like this, a circle shape, and it has a body that curves up like this. And it spends most of its life curved up like this, even in its larval state. It's really small, and it has, uh, it has a little fan shape at the tail, like a paintbrush, an old scrubby paintbrush. And when it's uh, busy flying around, it, um, it'll look kind of like, I think I'll put them up in here. I'm just going to draw a tiny one in the distance here. Uh, this is a damselfly. A damselfly is different from a dragonfly in that it is not a, it's not a voracious predator like this one. Uh, it has wings that never fold or close. I mean, the dragonflies don't fold or close. This one does. And when they're, when they're sitting, their wings, when this guy hatches his wings, in fact, we'll put little starter wings on it down here. They'll be like this to begin with. And eventually, they get long enough for this insect to fly. Um, he's going to want to move pretty quickly to get away from this hungry little dragonfly nymph because he'd be right on their menu at this point. And it will be throughout, throughout its life because dragonflies like tasty insects. Um, another thing we can do is down in this area, we can have, a, um, we have something in this pond that I think I have a, uh, oh, this guy right here. I'm going to draw him a little bigger than usual. This guy here is a giant diving beetle. It's a uh, giant water diver. And it has a body that's shaped like this. And it has legs in front that come right out from the front of his head. His front legs are like these. Now, I think he's kind of swimming over towards a, towards a little damselfly snack here. Uh, he's got his head right up in this area here. And he's got powerful, powerful grabbers here. And then he's got... Um, He's got a pattern on his body that looks kind of like this. Just draw a line coming back. And he's got four legs that come back like this. And these are the legs that help propel it as it's diving. And this is a large insect for, for an underwater environment. It can be pretty pretty good size compared to these others. A giant water beetle, water diver. Back along this area here, I want to draw something else. I'm going to have a, uh, I'm going to have a, uh, just a, a little shape coming down like this. It'll be coming over towards the water. And it's just a, a shape that looks kind of like, um, well, kind of like that. <laughs> it has four legs. And this is a salamander. It might just be coming out from under a log. They, they like to be in broken old logs like this one here. I'll hollow it out so you can crawl out of there. Maybe it's coming down get a little more moisture from the water. It's an amphibian, just like the frogs, and they lay soft-shelled eggs, and uh, and they need the moisture in the water. And so they spend a great deal of their life either in it or near it, and more so the frog than the, than the salamander. Um, along in the background here, I'm going to add just a bunch of these shapes sticking up behind this tree this old stump. I'm going to take some of these grasses and make them higher. I'm going to put some cattail heads on them. 
Uh, so these are leftovers from last year. They might have still that hot dog looking shape on top and some of them might have like cottony tufts like this. Um, but he, most of them are kind of a golden color and they've kind of come up and over and bend now and then the leaves will bend like this. But around them you have these brand new green shoots coming up through the water here all around the base from this mass of, uh, of roots that make a tangle all along the shore. It's a great place for insects to find shelter and protection. Um, it's also a great place for cattails to begin their seasonal life. They will grow taller, sometimes five, six feet tall, and eventually they'll, they'll turn golden and die, and another, another season will start the next year. Along in this area here, or maybe we'll put it back in this area beyond this section here, um, I'm going to draw some little oval shapes. You're going to have all kinds of plants growing down around the marshland. Uh, and back up in the woods here, along the base of these trees, you'll find trilliums and, and jack-in-the-pulpits and, and uh, many other plants uh, uh, of the season. Uh, around um, more hardwood trees, you're going to find the uh, morel mushrooms growing. So back in here, just draw a bunch of little shapes, kind of little scribbly shapes, and think of those flowers. You can't see them clearly here, but you can think of them. Now maybe in this little box up here, if you have a favorite thing you're drawing, or a favorite thing you'd like to draw and really look at close, like, rather than these little pretend flowers back in here that are nothing more than scribbles, um, you could draw that a little larger when we get to that part of the drawing, and I'll show you how to do that. Now, I'm going to pretend that this area back in here is a, is a plowed field. Uh, so I'm going to draw a little line that comes over here and down. Following the curve of the hill, I'm going to go behind this, behind this blue heron here that we started out with and down like this. So we have these furrows that the farmer plowed. And maybe there's a little stubble of corn from the year before or some other crop. And you see that old kind of crusty golden color. And uh, that'll all be plowed under soon and uh, before long new plants will be, new seeds will be planted and new crops will begin to grow. So see, what this, these little lines help take us further back in the drawing as well. It kind of gives us a, more of a feeling of distance as we go further away from us here. There are so many other animals that live in this area, so picking which one to do is, is kind of a challenge. Uh, we have otter that might be playing back in here, especially if it's closer to open water like a big lake. Um, you have fish swimming up in schools, uh, coming up upstream from the lakes. and and uh, But one thing I do want to draw is back in this area here, I've got some space. I'm going to draw a shape that looks about like that. It curves and it comes around. This is going to be a much bigger animal than the one we just drew. I'm just going to draw this shape coming around. And then right here I'm going to draw the head of a turtle sticking up here like this. And it's going to come out from the turtle shell here. And this could be any number of turtles. It could be a, uh, it could be a uh, snapping turtle. It could be a painted turtle. It could be a um, pretty much whatever turtle you want it to be. I'm going to draw a leg coming out here. And you won't see much of the other one. You might see just a little little bit of it here reaching forward. And you have the hind leg coming back here. And you won't even see the tail because it's kind of hidden under that. I'm going to make it look like it's coming towards us from underneath that area there. So I'll draw a little bit of the, the belly plates of this animal. And then I'm going to draw some lines coming around here and divide this up, this skirt around the base. And then I'm going to draw bigger lines like these coming up and just sort of divide this into a pattern. Now, different species have different patterns. We're kind of making this a generic uh, turtle drawing, so it could be pretty much whatever pattern you want to put. But if you want to look at it really close and add your own lines and make it look just like the real thing, get a turtle book, Turtles of, Turtles of the Great Lakes or reptiles and amphibians of the Great Lakes. I'm putting a pattern on it to darken it in. This will help it blend into the environment. Uh, it's very handy because uh, even though it doesn't have to hide so much from other things, being uh, so well protected by its shell, uh, it's kind of a slow-moving animal, and having that element of surprise is a great way to sneak up on its dinner guests. So it's often uh, patterned in such a way that you wouldn't even see it 
unless it was right next to you. So I'm going to have a little bit of this leg back there. So you have the turtle swimming here as well. Any different things we can add to this drawing? I'm going to go a little further back here. I think I'm going to have a tree line. I'm going to come along here. We'll add another another layer of land in the background. See how we go one layer and then another one there and another one there. It just takes us further back in our picture. Well, this might be back in the area closer to your houses. Maybe you live near, near a pond or a river, and you can put this little house back here or another one here like that. Now look how big that dragonfly is compared to these little tiny houses in the distance. That really tells us either that this is a giant dragonfly or that those houses are way far away. Let's go with that one, way far away. And um, unless you're writing a science fiction story about the giant dragonfly and the micro houses in the distance there. So, okay, and then back in here, if you draw just some lumpy lines like these, uh, you have a different kind of tree. This would be a a deciduous tree, a tree that has leaves like our oak and maple and walnut and and uh, different uh, beech and beech and birch and so many others, cottonwood and just a bunch of little wiggles for a whole different variety of trees. Uh, if you add some patterns on the left hand side of these it makes it look a little bit like there's um, some sun coming from the right. And then in the distance, instead of little tiny bumps, draw some big fluffy ones like these and think of, uh, think of uh, clouds in the sky in the background. If you want, you can add some wind blowing those clouds along here. See how that kind of pulls our eye down into our picture frame? makes the dragonfly wings stand out a little better and makes those trees in the distance show up a little better like that. And then way in the distance, you can have uh, two bumps here and pretend that's a cardinal. The bright red cardinal has been with us all winter long, but now it's springtime, so you might have a bluebird over here. And the blue jay has been here all winter as well, but the bluebird is a sure sign of spring. So is the robin, and so are the hummingbirds you'll see flying to and fro. And it's a time of great change and like life, a celebration of life. Just so many things showing up in our area uh, this time of year. I'm going to draw a little reflection from this heron standing in the water here. Just, just a couple of things. You don't have to draw the whole thing, but just enough to show that there's a little shadow cast or reflection in the water. It has a body that has a darker colored back and a lighter colored belly. So I'm going to add that. It has a crest on top of its head that's dark, and it kind of sticks back a little bit, like a little fancy hairdo, and has a, um, darker colored tail wings. And But the light, the belly of the belly of it, and this plumage here in the front, these long feathers, those are all light and bright, and a little darker, a little shadow underneath the, the belly at the legs there. Right up in here is where I'd like you to uh, take a moment and just draw this shape. Pretend that this is your head. I'm going to draw it looking like uh, an oval or an egg. It's kind of narrower at the bottom, wider at the top. You need more room for brains up here. You don't need as much room for your mouth down here. Your eyes go right in the middle, but to make it look like you're paying attention to the picture you're drawing, I'm just going to put a mark right there for the, for the eye. Uh, and then um, I'm going to draw the nose coming out this way. Let's pretend that's your nose and the other eye on the other side looking out that way. So now you're kind of aiming towards the picture instead of looking straight at us. I'm going to draw my mouth right there like that, right under my nose. And then I'm going to go across my eye here and just come back to about right, right there. And I'm going to draw my ear coming down like that like a number three, or a letter three backwards. And I'll draw my neck coming down here. And I'm, I see this one's coming down right, right by my ear. I'm going to come in, so I'm right under the mouth there like that. So my face sticks out a little bit more on this side. And then I'll draw my shoulders coming down this way. Now I want to dress for the occasion. I want to dress as though I'm going out and actually in nature and looking for looking for specimens that I could collect or for things I just want to study, catch and let go. 
Um, so I'm going to dress for the occasion, but what I want to do is also maybe have a container, maybe hold a container here. Maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a, a screen box for catching insects. I might have a butterfly net behind me and, uh, and use that to catch specimens that I can study. Um, or maybe a collecting jar. Maybe we're looking for specimens of, um, of water life and we want to take them back to the back to the lab or the studio and study them. We get a microscope and watch all these tiny little organisms swimming in the water that, um, that are, give us a chance to get a, an even closer understanding of the rich variety of life in springtime. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to draw, I think I'll draw a, a jar like this. I'll just draw a big jar coming down here like that. And um, I'm going to have my arms coming down over here like this. See, I'm just kind of making this up as I go. I'm going to carry that to there to that, and I'll put my hand there like that. And I'm going to have suspenders, or I'm going to have maybe for my backpack. Yeah, that's more like it. Have my backpack here like that for going out and carrying my my sketchbooks, my journals, and things when I'm out in nature. I've got a shirt that has a collar like this coming down. And I probably wear a hat that looks kind of like this one here. Kind of looks like a little fallen halo coming down like that. And then I have a top to the hat that has a shape like this one. And it might even be a straw hat. It might have a pattern of crisscross lines like this on it just to keep the sun off. I'm not too worried about rain today. And so I just put a pattern on it kind of like that. I have hair that comes down here and over here. Um, I have a mustache and a beard. You don't have to draw that, especially if you're a girl. And um, we go ahead and think of what you would look like as, as a scientist, as uh, going out and collecting these. I'm going to have shirt sleeves here like this. Maybe it's still a little cool. And I might have a shirt on that has a flannel pattern of some kind. I'll probably have a compass here. I usually use my iPhone, but just in case that doesn't work, I have a compass attached right there so I can find my way back. And, uh, and I might have a pocket here that has things in it like pens and pencils for drawing or, or tweezers for looking closely at specimens. And, and uh, put some gloves on here. Maybe I've got... And then down in here, I, I'm going to make this look like one of those uh, science jars here, usually a black top like this. It reflects and it might have a label on top. And down in here, I, I just have some kind of a animal. Maybe it's a diving beetle. I'll have this one going the other way like that. These are fascinating to look at. And if you look at the surface of the water, you have these long leggedy water striders, just draw little shapes like these. They're called the boatmen and water striders. They, they actually float on the surface of the water. The tensile strength of the water holds them up and they they can um, paddle with their long legs and scoot along pretty easily. And fascinating little things. Just draw little shapes and imagine little insects like that working their way around. Down in this area in the foreground, we have a chance to add more things. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some different fish in here to show we have a variety. Here you have bluegill, bass, perch, uh, you have uh, uh, you have uh, pike even uh, maybe a big pike swimming back in here. So this is a place to fill this up with things you would like to see. And if you're a fisherman, uh, if you like going fishing and uh, you want to find a pike back here, draw your dream fish. Draw whatever you want to be looking for. It's got a nice long needle-like shape to its body and and uh, sharp jaggedy teeth. You want to watch out for. And the bass and the perch, the sunfish, the bluegill, just a wonderful variety of fish, all sharing this environment with, um, with a lot of other creatures of different kinds. If you have room back in here, somewhere over here, and you want to draw a deer, this is the time deer would be out and uh, wandering about. Mine looks more like a horse. They'd be out too. Um, but go ahead and draw... Use your imagination and think what you would have around you and your environment. If you live close to a pond or a stream, uh, you, might, uh, you might be familiar with a lot of these things. And otherwise, uh, uh, add, add your own information from your own, uh, from your own environment. Um, right up here, I'm going to put my name. I'm going to sign my name in this area here. 
And I like to put the date on my drawing, too, so I can remember when I started it. I could easily put another hour or two in this drawing, just richening up the textures and adding more details, more fish, and little minnows like these, and uh, just fill it up with a lot of different things to make it look more more realistic and believable. Um, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to put the date right here. I'm going to write the date. And, and you're going to write the date when you do this. I put this on mine so I remember when I when I did this. I'm going to write a uh, 5 for May and a 14 for today and a 20 for the year 2020. Now you'll put your date on your drawing when you do this with me in your comfort of your own home. And um, that way you'll remember. Now, maybe you have a place where you could write a title for it. I'm just going to call this um, Pond Life in the Spring. And uh, that's about it for this drawing. I want to thank you very much for joining me. And I hope you have fun adding more details to this, more color to it. And um, find a nature book and look at it and think of all that. Look for the things that we missed here that belong in this picture. We've got butterflies all over the place coming soon. So but they'd be back in here. They'd be, they might be flying near the water, but they'd you know, draw butterflies back in here and think of all the different varieties of butterflies you have. See what I mean? I, I was about ready to be done, and all of a sudden I'm thinking of new things I can add to it. That's how these drawings go. They just keep you imagining and adding to them. Uh, don't forget the colors. Bright, beautiful springtime colors will make this look absolutely fantastic. Thanks again for drawing with me. Look forward to seeing you again.